For Inside Carolina, I'm Taylor Vipolis, and this is a new podcast to the Inside Carolina lineup up in the rafters where 2017 ACC Player of the Year National Champion Justin Jackson and myself will be talking about all things Carolina basketball. Before we get started, though, I just wanted to say thank you for being here. Be sure you subscribe to Inside Carolina wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube so you never miss out on any of the content the team at IC puts out. The support doesn't go unnoticed on this end. Speaking of support, we want to support the people that support us. So that's why I've got to mention our friends over at Johnny T-Shirt. When it comes to Carolina apparel, they have everything that you could possibly want. They have the T-shirts, the jerseys, the hats. You name it, they will probably have it, including now the Final Four commemorative gear. It's great people and great customer service since it's locally owned and operated by alumni. If you're going to be in Chapel Hill, you can visit them in person on Franklin Street, or you could go online at johnnytshirt.com. And don't forget, Inside Carolina premium subscribers save 10% off their orders. It's up in the rafters. As always, I'm joined by my guy, Justin Jackson. And Justin, big episode today with Theo Pinson joining us later on. A lot to break down from a massive weekend with little time to waste before New Orleans. There's only one place to start. What did you think of Will Smith slapping Chris Rock at the Oscars? (laughs) Oh, we're going to start with that, man. I don't want to get canceled too, bro. Um, Dang. That was the craziest thing. I would say that's the craziest thing I think I've ever seen happen on live TV. I would say that. That was, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, it's staged. I don't think that was staged. And that that was a that was a grown man really uh really taking some anger out. Um so I hope I hope they can resolve whatever issues, you know, that I, they have. But that was wild. I wild moment on in uh, television history. I had to throw the curveball at you to start, but seriously, we're heading to the third weekend of the NCAA tournament and the North Carolina Tar Heels. They're still dancing in the damn thing, man. They (laughs) go to Philadelphia. They beat UCLA in an epic sweet 16 matchup. And then they run through the Cinderella of the tournament, St. Peter's in the elite eight. What were your biggest takeaways from the weekend watching this team? And you start off with the first game against UCLA, obviously against a, you know, a blue blood, um, a team that is, you know, that were playing really, really well. Um, to see them win, um, and pull it out, you know, in, in a game that, you know, for me, it was always tougher playing in that first game of whatever weekend you were in, right? Like you travel in, you have that whole week at, you know, in Chapel Hill, you travel in, um, you've got like an open practice or whatever. And then you got to play a game. Um, and so for them to come out and win that game, uh, I think was uh, very impressive. Um, and then I think, too, you know, a lot of people kind of just sweep over the fact that they beat St. Peter's the way they beat them. But they did exactly what they were supposed to do. You know, like at the end of the day, St. Peter's, and, and kudos to them, the run that they made, the coach, you know, unbelievable coach. The players obviously did an unbelievable job. Um, but North Carolina was just so much – bigger athletic um, than they were. And they went in there and they did exactly what they were supposed to do defensively. They really shut them down, especially at the beginning of the game. Um, And then offensively, obviously, with Armando having that, you know, monster of a game, did exactly what they were supposed to do on the inside. So, you know, I think you can kind of have different sort of takeaways, but I love, you know, I I was talking to some of the guys on my team um, before that St. Peter's game, and I was like, you know, unbiasedly, I feel like North Carolina is going to go out here and actually win pretty handedly, you know, or at least they're supposed to. And the fact that they went out there and did that, that was, that was impressive to me. You mentioned UCLA being a, a, a blue blood that Carolina has taken down, obviously a blue blood next up in Duke. You, you look at the final four. I've seen some people debate this. You have Carolina, you have Duke, you have Kansas in your mind. Has Villanova reached blue blood status? I'm going to be honest, man. The, the job that Jay Wright has done with Villanova and some of the teams they've had over the past, we'll just say, seven to ten years, they might have crept into that blue blood status. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, we lost to them in 16. Uh, they won again, you know, two years later. Now they're back in the Final Four. Um, they, they've got to be at least right on the outside looking in. Um, Cause I feel like they're always in the conversation at the end of the year 
as far as one of the best teams, top seeds going into the tournament. So me personally, if I had to say it, I would say that just over the last 10 years, they've earned a way into the blue blood conversation. I know a lot of people will say like, oh, but it's only been the last 10 years. Like, well, that's kind of what I'm going off of. So if I had to, if I had to make a judgment, I would say that they're right there. They might not have a, uh, a table and bottle service at the club, but they're, they're allowed in the club. They're allowed in for sure. They're not yeah. turned away. They're definitely allowed in. <laughs> <laughs> the, the UCLA game was awesome. Probably, probably my favorite game that I've ever been in attendance. It was high level back and forth basketball. And then eventually it turned into the Caleb Love show. When you see Love doing that with the level of confidence that he plays with, what's going through your mind or what would be going through your mind if you're a teammate out there with him? Find him. Give him the ball. Um, I think, you know, a lot of times, you know, people that maybe haven't played basketball or, you know, really been in, in a high-level sports setting, um, there's, there's at times, you know, that, that when you're on the court or wherever – that you kind of go into like a different space mentally, right? Like you don't, you can't even really, you can't really describe it, but it's almost like anything you throw up at the rim, it's going to go in. And I think that's literally, that's, that's what mode Caleb Love was in. I mean, you look at some of the shots that he shot, you would consider bad shots. Like, oh, like that's, and it goes in, right? And I think that the, the, the coolest thing for me was like you said, the confidence and the aggression that he had throughout that entire time when he started going crazy in the second half. Um, you know, and, and I want to see that same exact aggression and confidence, even if he's not scoring 30. I want to see that same thing in this next game against Duke because I feel like the team can feed off of that, right? Like the team, if he hits a big shot, the team feeds off that. So then defensively, okay, now we go down, we get another stop, he comes down, hits another one. You know, it just it's it's like a snowball effect in a good way. You know, so I think it's seeing that I think is exactly how I want to see Caleb play this next game against Duke because I think it makes them so much better. Um, and obviously, you know, kudos to him. I mean, you know, throughout the season, um, you know, he's been obviously from three, he's been super consistent. Um, and to see him step up in that time for his team, I think shows the type of talent and the type of player he really is. Yeah. If you're the opposing team and Caleb Love starts chucking and making, and he's pulling from the logo and he's, he's talking a lot of smack out there on the court, just pack your bags, go home. I, and I think my favorite storyline from the UCLA game is he starts off one of eight from the field in the space jams. He goes into the locker room at halftime Eric Hoots, uh, who works with the basketball team kind of behind the scenes, he goes up to Caleb and says, you don't play good in the black shoes, switch shoes. Caleb Love switches to the Pantones. He dropped 27 points in the, uh, in the second half with his new shoes. And I, I just, I love thinking about like Hoots on the bench, like tracking the analytics of guys like, how they're playing with, with shoes to know that, you know, what would you kind of make of, of love coming out with different shoes based off somebody's recommendation and then going out there and just going nuclear in the second half? Yeah. I mean, me personally, I've never really, um, when I put on a pair of shoes, unless they're just hurting my feet, when I put on a pair of shoes to play in a game, whether I start off 11 for 11 or 0 for 11, I don't ever think it's the shoes, you know, like, I think it's, you know, it, it's obviously the way I'm shooting or whatever. Um, but Hey, sometimes players need whatever it is to kind of, you know, click over to that different mindset. So hoots, uh, you know, shout out to hoots, obviously one of the guys that makes that, that program run. Um, and obviously showed that his intelligence on, uh, you know, what games Caleb plays the best in and what shoes he plays the best in. You know, obviously that he was right because that second <laughs> half he was. Oh man, I think he he that was a I have to say that that was like a legendary performance with the way that he was getting shot after shot, tough shot after tough shot, and just seeing how his confidence level just grew over that second half. I, that was a that was a fun thing to watch for sure. 
Yeah, I had my press pass from the Wells Fargo Center, and inside Carolina's seat on the front row goes to Greg Barnes, who does a ton of great work for Inside Carolina, has been covering the team for 15 years. And the overflow for the extra media was in the balcony level. So that's where I had to watch the St. Peter's game. And at the end of the St. Peter's game, I was like, I, I simply cannot watch the UNC game from up here. As appreciative I am to be in the building, I was like, I, I just cannot be up here. So I went down um, at the end of the St. Peter's um, Purdue game and the radio team was leaving and from St. Peter's and I was like, Hey, are you guys using the seat? And they were like, yeah, no, uh, we're leaving. We're getting out of here. No problem for you to use this seat. So I was lucky enough to sit in the front row for that UCLA game. And it was, it was probably the coolest experience I've had at a basketball game, because like you, like you mentioned, seeing Caleb Love do that in person and seeing how much he talks on the court I think that's something that you can lose when uh, you're watching on TV or you're up, a, you're up a bit higher. And that was like one of the first takeaways I had in my video where, you know, the UCLA defender, I think it was Bernard, wasn't putting up a hand when Caleb Love was shooting at first. And Caleb's jawing him back and forth saying, you know, you better put up a hand, you better put up a hand. And then uh, when Bernard started to put up a hand and Love would make – Caleb was just screaming back at him, you know, I'm him, I'm him, I'm him. <laughs> so it was like, it was such a, a cool experience to see a player kind of have that, that takeover moment, like in the, uh, in the street video games where you're just, you're just throwing up anything and you're on fire and um, everything's kind of going right. And then you have the, the St. Peter's game next to talk about the St. Peter's game. It felt like the, um, the, meme and the the gif from the movie uh new jack city where wesley snipes is crying with the gun where it's like carolina said like we have to put you down st peter's we have to put down <laughs> cinderella um in ending st peter's improbable run from the jump even even in warm-ups i thought it was pretty clear that unc would win that they were an eight and a half point favorite obviously st peter's um, you can see why they've had such a deep run with the way they play and how they kind of take on the identity of Shaheen Holloway. How early in that one did you get the sense that it was over? You, you talked about talking with your teammates and thinking that Carolina was going to win. How early did you kind of get that sense? Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I kind of saw it, and it was obviously early on in the game. You can't really make, make much of it because it's a long game of basketball, but – just now watching how they got up. I think they went up 9-0, um, you know, in the first, like, four minutes. Um, and just kind of seeing how they got up to that point, uh, I just didn't really see St. Peter's having enough to be able to withstand the athleticism, the size, the shooting that North Carolina had. Um, you know, obviously not taking away at all from their amazing run that they made and the unbelievable job that their coach was doing coaching them. Um, but I think just kind of watching that, it just seemed like, you know, defensively North Carolina wasn't letting them breathe. You know, it, it was, it was just like, they didn't have, they didn't have any kind of, uh, way of scoring the ball and keeping up with what North Carolina was doing. So I think just watching that in the first probably four or five minutes was kind of had me kind of thinking, okay, I think they might be able to get this one pretty easily. Yeah, North Carolina had doubled up St. Peter's by halftime, leading 38 to 19. What was it like for you to see an emotional Hubert Davis after the game celebrating with the team? Because not only are you a former player of his, but you've been saying all year pretty consistently that he is the guy for the job to kind of have that sense of validation. Yeah, I mean, I, I um, you know, from day one, uh, you know, I think, even when you go back and you look at when Coach Williams first said he was going to retire, right? And, you know, UNC um, athletic directors, everybody, they, they, they talked to a whole lot of people, you know, within whether it was former players, former coaches, whatever, um, as far as who they thought might be a good, you know, might be a good replacement for coach, I guess I would say. And when they had mentioned Coach Davis, I immediately – said yes. Coach Davis is the one 
that I think is going to do exactly what you want, which is, you know, get North Carolina, you know, back to where they were a couple years ago, um, while also keeping Carolina basketball, Carolina basketball. Um, and I think from that, from that moment, there was never a time when I ever thought like, man, maybe coach Davis isn't the one for the job. This whole time, I, I think I would say that I've been one of the main ones saying coach Davis is exactly who these guys mean, right? Like a lot of it falls on the players on, you know, whatever. But I think seeing him in his first year, especially with how kind of the season went early on, right? Like seeing the ups and downs and everything and seeing how they played some of the losses they had and to see them get to the final four. Um, I think for me, it's the perfect, you know, perfect ending to kind of a story of his first season, you know, and, and just seeing how so many people, um, you know, were so anti coach Davis when the season first started. And, you know, when things started getting a little rocky there for a second, they automatically went to coach Davis, you know, to see him never waver. And you look at all of his press conferences, he never wavered from the confidence that he had in the team. He never wavered in his message for the team. He never wavered in anything that he said from the very beginning of the season. And I think that just shows what kind of man that Coach Davis is. And obviously it shows what kind of a coach he is. So I'm, I'm so happy for Coach Davis. I know he's loving every bit of this, but I think from the outside and obviously as a former player, I love, I love seeing him back. North Carolina is going to head to New Orleans pretty soon. And Huber Davis might – be gritting his way all the way down to the final four what have you been thinking how would you rate his dance moves post game I'm, like, I'm not gonna lie his dance moves were compared to some of the other coaches that i've seen in the locker room his dance moves were uh they were impressive like it shows that coach davis keeps up with uh you know the the current the current theme of dances and things like that so i, I was impressed for sure when he started getting into his bag with the gritty, I was like, when, oh, when yeah. he started, yeah, when he started hitting that, I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, he's really, he's feeling it right now, for sure. We're going to take a quick ad break for the national guys. And when we get back, Theo Pinson joins the podcast. And we're obviously going to be talking about the Duke Final Four. So we'll see you on the other side of this break. Joining us now on the podcast, one of the biggest fan favorites in Carolina basketball history a national champion and legend in his own right from the Dallas Mavericks. We've got Theo Pence and Theo first. Thanks for joining us. And second, March 15th, you, you became a father. So congratulations on the baby girl. How have the Thank first you. few weeks of fatherhood been? And have you gone to Justin for any tips? Um, first off, I would like to say thank you. Second of all, I've not gone to Justin about anything. Um, and also it's been, I'm just playing. I have went to Justin a couple times, <laughs> but uh, it's been great, man. I mean, I couldn't be more happier. Couldn't be more excited. Uh, she's great. Um, the first week was happened so fast. I couldn't even wrap my hand around what was really happening, but I'm excited and uh, very excited. I just thought that's all I like to say. Justin, what kind of tips did you give as you've kind of gone from rookie to vet status now? Literally. I mean, that feels always been a little bro. You know what I mean? Oh, uh, my God. But, you know, now that we're in this situation, um, no, I mean, I, I already knew Theo. He'd take it head on. He's going to be a great dad. Um, I, one, of, one of my biggest advices was uh, when uh, – when the, when the mom starts getting a little agitated or whatever, you got to just take your licks right now. Going through this time, uh, a lot happens to the mom's body, mental, all that kind of stuff. Um, so just got to gotta take the licks sometimes whenever they come at you and just continue to try to provide and, and be there and care for them. A couple of future Tar Heels being raised. I, I, could, I could sense it already. But, Theo, what has it been like for you to watch the success that this team and Hubert Davis, your former coach, have been having? Uh, it's been exciting. Um, I know after the Sweet 16 game, I text Caleb Leakey and uh, RJ and just told him I was just proud of him. I mean, they could have easily just taken all the criticism after the losses against the pretty good teams that they played and 
just went the other direction. They just stayed the course and they trusted each other and just stayed together. And I think that's the biggest thing a team can do is not worry about what everybody else is saying and just worry about what's going on in the locker room. So I was just proud of them doing that in that aspect. So for them to make it this far and have that experience that me and Justin were able to have is big time. And I'm just very proud of them. What What would you say your, your best Hubert Davis story is that you have? My best Hubert Davis story. Uh, it's not really a, I mean, I just know one thing. His wife makes these rolls that I for every time I go back to Chapel Hill. So I I don't know if that's what's contributing to the success, but <laughs> I know I need another batch of rolls. <laughs> she makes these rolls. And I heard they're not even hard to make either. They just they get them from the store, they just put them in the oven. But every time we went over to Coach Davis house, I would leave about eight or nine rolls in a bag and give her a hug and just dip. So it's not even a Coach Davis story. <laughs> just the rolls. Yeah, just the rolls. Coach Davis, uh, recently, he, he's been talking about how he wants to get the program back essentially to the national respect and the national kind of relevance, and that that means so much to him. What does that kind of mean to you both, starting with you, Theo? Uh, it means a lot. It means a lot. I mean – especially when you're in locker rooms and you're talking to other guys and they doing what they're doing with their teams. You just want to make sure they know we, we still run the nation at the end of the day. We, we always make final fours. We're always winning. I mean, at the end of the day, everyone knows about Carolina. It's one of, one of the most renowned schools in the country. So we, uh, I like talking junk. So if you're giving me reason to talk junk, I'm, I'm good. So I just want us to keep doing what we're doing and um, do as much winning as we can. Justin, what does it mean to you? Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of exactly what Theo is talking about. I think nothing has changed as far as how um, respected and how well-known North Carolina is um, and, and North Carolina basketball. Um, but I think for me, you know, obviously it's great for the whole program, great for the university. But I think, like Theo said, for these guys that are on the team, you know, we talked about on the podcast earlier in the season, like, you know, they had some bad losses, right? Like they had some games that they probably shouldn't have lost or, you know, they got beat by 20 or whatever, or just some bad games that we knew they were too talented of a team to like allow happen, you know, um, and to now see them playing their best basketball now and to go to a final four for one in Coach Davis's first season, but to bounce back like they have within this, you know, within this season, um, you know, I think it's one of those things that it's, it's great to see this actual team be able to experience. Yeah, it's, it's crazy that North Carolina, they lost to Purdue. Purdue looked like a, a Final Four team. They lost to Tennessee. Tennessee looked like a Final Four team. They lost to Kentucky. Kentucky looked like a Final Four team. And now it's Carolina that's actually the Final Four team. So it's kind of crazy to see how much of a turnaround this season has been. What would you guys say the the final four experience is like as a player when you are balancing having so much fun but also there to win a game at the same time? Oh, uh, I mean, I think everybody knows I was the guy to keep everybody loose and having a good time. Um, I mean, I was just I was just trying to be in the moment. I mean, if there was a time where we were able to have a good time and have fun, like the fan fest that we were able to do before the whole tournament starts, I remember, I mean, Justin can be back me up on this. We were doing everything. Like, we were having a blast. And I can remember other teams were, like, so serious and, like, not trying. They were just sitting there eating and, like, watching TV. I'm like, you can do that in a room. So I think it – there's enough pressure that comes to the final four, like comes with it. So you have to find ways to like get away a little bit and relax to stay locked in and also just enjoy being at the final four. Cause everyone doesn't get this opportunity. So I think it's one of those things where you just got to enjoy the moment and be in it also. Yeah. The final four for me was, that was the most fun that I've ever had when it comes to basketball and everything that's around it. Um, 
and thankfully for our team, like, like Theo said, like we had guys, I'll never forget, like even the rides, like on the bus, when we had the speaker blast in the back, like listen to music, you know, like we had a great team that was able to enjoy themselves, laugh, have a good time when it was time to have a good time. And then once the game came, like, okay, now let's lock it in, you know, now let's, let's get ready. Let's, let's play whoever we're playing. Um, so I think my, like my only advice is just to enjoy it. Like Theo said, like, we, I mean, the amount of basketball players that go through college basketball that don't even come close to a final four and the experience that you have with that, enjoy every minute of it. And then once you get on the court, then you know, it's business, but enjoy everything that comes with the final four. Cause it's one of those things that you don't know if you'll make it back or don't know, you know, if you'll ever be able to go again. Yeah. On the on those bus trips, who who's getting the aux? It's a great question. I don't even remember. <laughs> I think low key DJ Jax was on the aux for a little bit. I know that for sure. Uh, I know I probably not let that happen. <laughs> oh, he let it happen. You hear that, Vip? You hear it? Like he was the he was the the, the bodyguard. I let that happen. Kennedy though. I think Kennedy, it was Kennedy. Kennedy definitely had it a lot of the time. So we'll give him credit. Was there, I'm was, be, there, was there anybody on those final four teams where it was like, this guy's definitely not getting it? Probably like Dillman. Like, yeah. Dillman or like. Dillman. Uh, I ain't going to lie, though. JB sometimes has some suspect songs, too, that you were like, I don't know. I, 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 I love my boy. JB. Or the know what they're saying. I'm like, JB, what are they talking about? <laughs> oh, you don't know? You don't know? Oh, is it. You remember the treasure song? <laughs> yes. <laughs> come on, bro. Oh, JB, like, he would come with some hits, and then other ones would be like, nah, JB, we got to hit next on that, that one, bro. That one ain't it. <laughs> he, he wasn't batting a, a good percentage, but how would you guys feel if you were in these guys' shoes getting ready to play in the Final Four against Duke for the first time in school Boy. history. Because I think it's easy to say to the guys, like, kind of enjoy the moment. But when you, when you bring in now the, the Duke aspect of it, how would that kind of change how you would feel as a player, Justin? Uh, I mean, that's tough. Because Duke games in the regular season are hard enough to get, like, to get all the nerves out, to get everything to where you can just go play basketball. Um, I mean, the only thing I could possibly tell them is like, hey, let's, we've been doing it all se all season, all tournament. Let's just go out here and let's play this game like we've played all the other ones. You know, let's go out here and let's compete. Uh, we know who they are. We've seen them multiple times in the season. Let's try to just go out there and treat it like another game. But I mean, it's, that's, that's, that's a totally different type of, you know, if you want to call it a pressure that we never had to really deal with. So hopefully they can uh, keep the right mindset. The only thing I can compare this to, this is by, this is the biggest game in basketball history. <laughs> <laughs> in college basketball history, this is the biggest game. You could I'll make the argument. You, the only thing I can compare this to, and this is only personal to like the guys who won it in 17, the second championship was the most pressure I've ever felt in my life. You can't lose. You can't lose twice. You get there once and you got lucky to get there twice. You can't lose the second time. Then it's like, all right, what's going on? Yeah. So this is, that's the closest thing that I can, that, that pressure of getting there the second time is a little bit relatable to what they're about to go through because at the end of the day, it's everybody who knows both teams. It's still the first time being there. So it's already going to be nerve wracking in the first place. But I know one thing. I know for a fact I would love to be in that game. You give me a chance. I, could, I wish me, Justin, and Joel, you give us a chance to end Coach K's career <laughs> with an L. Oh. Oh, I'll be too hyped. That'll be my problem. I had two fouls in the first five. Oh my God, that would be dumb hype. Yeah, that, that would be, it's going to be an unbelievable game for fans. But I think once again, like the players enjoy every moment, moment of that game too. Like 
like you yeah. said, like it's history to see this in the final four, to see Coach K's last – could be possibly his last game. Like, you win that game, it's like, okay, oh. you just etched yourself into some serious, like, yeah. USC legend history and, like, just basketball history. So, pull up a chair, buddy. Facts. <laughs> the, the, uh, Theo, how much do you think it helps – or should help this team that the last time these two teams played, it was UNC winning and the Duke players folding under the pressure of Kay's last game at Cameron and not the reverse where Duke blew out UNC in Chapel Hill. And now this Duke team does have the pressure of this being Kay's last tournament against the biggest rival for the first time in school history. Yeah. I mean, you just have the confidence, you know, you can beat them now, you know, you can get them. And you just got to go out there and play your best basketball. I mean, you know the nerd. Whichever team calms down first is going to have the advantage, pretty much. Like, your adrenaline is going to be high. You just got to – You. this is a saying I always remember from Coach Williams. If You, whoever, you got to lose yourself in the game. When that ball goes up, you got to lose yourself in that game. Just go play. And if we can do that, we'll be fine. And uh, this question is for both of you, but Justin, you, you could start it off. Duke runs a ton of, you know, NBA ISO. They have like very, very little stuff out of horn sets, but it, it's a lot of just give the ball to uh, Banchero, let him try to go one-on-one, -on -one, try to let these guards go one-on-one. -on -one. What's the key for preparing and defending that style of play compared to a team like, you know, UVA, UCLA, or even like a St. Peter's who is going to run you through a ton of off ball movement? Yeah. I mean, it, it is different, you know, but coach K has been doing that for a while now with kind of some of the talent that he's had come through. Like he, he does a lot more isolation plays for the guys at the high elbows. Um, and just give them space to, to play. I think when you watch the last North Carolina Duke game, I think they did a good job of packing the paint um, while also being able to get out to shooters. You know what I'm saying? Like, you still got guys like Griffin and, you know, even um, – even – what's his name? Jeremy – was it Roche. Jeremy Rose? Yeah, uh, Roche. Point guard who's actually been playing really well in the tournament. Um, you got guys like, like them that can still make plays. But I think when you're going into a game like this – the more that you make those type of guys make winning plays as opposed to letting Benchero get comfortable and get going and, you know, maybe start getting guys in foul trouble or whatever. I think you're living more with other guys hitting some shots as opposed to letting him do those things. So that's kind of, if I had to do it, obviously I'm not in those, I'm not in the coaching seat, thank goodness. Um, but I think coach Davis is going to have some good schemes to kind of, get him uncomfortable and hopefully make some other guys make some plays. And Theo, what about you? What do you think the key is to defending that ISO style? Show bodies. I definitely wouldn't let Pablo get going because Pablo's built. Like he, he, he wants to have moments like he, you can just tell in players sometimes they want moments like this. So you don't want to get him going because it could be a long night, but then I think Justin can tell you after there's one for nine in the national championship game, it's hard to shoot in that dome. So if you can pack the paint and uh, don't leave Griffin, though, of course, he's he's like their bona fide shooter. So I think if you could pack the paint, force kickouts and see if they see how they're test the waters from three, then you can fill out the game. But it's definitely going to be one of those fill out games. Uh, and points in the paint is going to be pivotal, in my opinion. So don't let Pablo get going and just see how to – I agree with Justin. See if those other guys can make some shots. Justin, hey, how Vip, you, hear how you, try to, you hear how you try to slide a little jab in there? Come on, <laughs> one for nine, over nine. Hey, I was actually look. over nine. I was over nine. <laughs> I was over. So I appreciate, I appreciate the one shot that you gave oh, me. Oh, my God. He gave me it's the okay. benefit of the doubt with the one. Hey, hey, great back door, though. I found hey, you. Great door. Justin, <laughs> how, how, how much different is it shooting in a building that holds 75,000 people compared to the arenas and the sight lines that you're normally used to seeing? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the depth perception is, is you, can't, 
really, yeah, you can't even really like compare it to anything. I mean, you you have that small basketball court inside an entire football arena, like a football stadium. Um, but I think like, you know, as, as, as a shooter, like the first game we played against Oregon, I shot the ball really well, right? Like, so you're able to, if you can, focus in on just you being on the court. But when you take a step back and you kind of look at, you know, like like the first time stepping on the court for open practice, it was like, dude, I don't know if I'm going to be able to hit any sort of jumper. Like this is – there's no backdrop. Like there's nothing. Um, but hopefully they like, – like Theo said, hopefully they can just lose themselves, go out there and hope. Don't even focus on the fact that they're in a football stadium. Um, you know, and just go play the game of basketball that, he, that they've played for so long. The uh, the first time I ever shot in the Dean Dome, I couldn't hit the rim. I don't know if it was my skill or the sideline, but I think I can relate a little. <laughs> it's the most relatable I've ever heard you talk. Talking about. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but, Theo, uh, a lot of people compare – leaky black to yourself because you both were players or are players who found their found their role accepted their role and with those roles kind of propelled the team to even even more success what do you like about leaky's game uh i think exactly that i mean he's he knows his game he understands what his he has to do to help his team win uh, I think that's what it comes down to. Just like my situation also, I I knew I wasn't on the court to score the ball. I had Justin, Joel, Isaiah, and Kennedy. What I need to score the ball for, we scored enough points. So uh, I was just out there to just do all the other stuff and make plays for them, get them the ball when they need it, and uh, score when I was called upon. And uh I think that's the biggest thing for him that's made this team take it to another level. And I think, um, like, I'm proud of him. He's playing really well right now. And like I said, I remember it's going to come a time he's going to have to knock one down. And I know I had I had a big shot against Oregon that was, did they think it was going to come to me? Nope, but I was ready. So I think he has to be ready at all times because I think they're – we got to be honest, they're going to be smart and they're going to want him to beat them. So you can, there are multiple ways for that to, that he can help and make plays. So I'm sure he knows, he knows what's going to happen, uh, how the game's going to play out and they're going to want the ball to find him, but he's been there before. And he's doing a really good job this year. When you were back in Chapel Hill this past summer and you're playing pickup with the guys, did you see this potential of the final four potential that this team is kind of showing off now? Uh, when I was there in the summer, I wouldn't say final four. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know that, but I would tell you, um, I don't, I want to say I told Montrose, but I forgot who it was after the Purdue game. I knew they had a shot. They played so well that game against a team that's really good. And I knew, had a, I knew Purdue had a really good chance, but seeing them go against them and play at that high level, I was like, they have a shot. Like, you got everything you need to compete with them, and you didn't have Leaky that game. So that was one of the things that I took from that game. I was like, they got a chance that they could put it together. And at the end of the day, you just got to get hot at the right time, and they got hot. Yeah, North Carolina has won 16 of their last 19 games. Coach Davis has been saying this is the healthiest this team has been all year for the past like month, month and a half now. Final question for both of you guys. Justin, you could start it off. Will the outcome of this game change how the rivalry is looked at between both fan bases and from a national perspective with one side gaining a uh, a pretty big edge? No, no, this this rivalry has been around for too long. Um, At the end of the day, there's a lot of stuff going into this game, but it's one game within the rivalry. Um, I think obviously Duke will have bragging rights if they end up winning and North Carolina, North Carolina will have bragging rights if we win. Um, but I don't, I don't think it'll change the legacy of the rivalry. I think the rivalry will still say the same. Both fan bases will hate each other. 
it'll be the best rivalry in all of sports still. Um, so I don't, I don't think it'll really change anything. Theo, what about you? Yeah, I agree. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a big stage. You want to win this one. But uh, let's just thank God it's not the one that's the next one. <laughs> you don't want it to be the national championship one because that would be real ugly. <laughs> but uh, like I said, like Justin said, this rivalry has been around for too long, too many great players. And if anything, it's going to bring more attention to it. So it's, it's, it's great for both programs, and it's going to be probably the most watched game in Final Four history. You're in Milwaukee on Sunday, the day before, uh, the day after the game. I will be Sunday night if we win this game. <laughs> Are, do you and Reggie have plans to watch the game together Saturday? I don't know if I can watch it with anybody. I think I got to be in my room. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I don't even know if I could be around anyone. I got to be in my own thoughts. You know, I might go on live for a second. You never know. <laughs> I need right. to be a sanctuary. <laughs> you know, the hotel in Milwaukee is a little weak. <laughs> Something, but <laughs> we'll see. On Saturday, it's Duke, North Carolina in the Final Four for the first time in NCAA tournament history. Get your mind right. Hubert Davis is looking for guys ready to fight. No backing down now. Justin, Theo, appreciate the time today.